Hey guys, check out this podcast. My buddy Ben Weiss, buy beverages. Um, some things have changed. Google it if you can. He, he recently left, left the company after selling it for $1.7 billion. So who knows? Maybe he's on an island somewhere. You're going to love this podcast. Check it out. Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. Here we are in Pittsfield. Johnny Waite, Sephra, Tim Nye, Joe DeSena, Marion. And um, this one is with Ben Weiss. And Ben is the CEO of Buy. And the fan yeah. founder. Sorry? And the founder. Uh-huh. And the founder. And uh, Buy is a drink company that just sold for $1.7 billion. Congratulations. That's with a B. That's with a B. And yeah. if you want to find out <laughs> Big B, what it takes B. to be that successful, this is your guy. I mean, this <laughs> he just owns this, crushes this. <laughs> We are here for Spartan Up Podcast at Buy with the CEO and founder. Oddly enough, look behind him. Go, oh, hold on. He has his own kettlebell. There you go. And just oh like me, God. just like me, his meal, his meal of choice is celery. Celery and buy, it's all you need. <laughs> well, Joe, welcome. And he's from Staten Island. Yeah, there you go. The word is now out. So tell me, what do we got going on here? So, hey, welcome to Buy Quarters. Thanks. Uh, I know you're probably wondering where you're headed halfway down the road. Well, I was stuck in the Trenton, lobby. But... I couldn't figure out how to get in, and then the door opened as if I was in a Frankenstein movie. No, oh, I hope you got that on video. But I always say brands like Buy yep. deserve to be on the cusp of a tough neighborhood. Yeah. On the tracks, oh, of the, got... on the train tracks. Oh, the train tracks. Which right you'll back see, there. and it'll, like sh- that, yeah. it'll shake the building. Yeah, you're on the right uh, side of the train as Amtrak, tracks. Yeah, as Amtrak goes by. But really, this is home. It became home back in 2011. And really, it was this one room. Uh, when I uh, kind of busted out of my, my basement in my little townhouse, I needed more space. So I took this space, which is probably about 3,000 square feet. Now, we just sprawled, and we have about 50,000 square feet here. Wow. But what I like about this particular room is a couple of things. One is you see on our walls, um, you see the topography of coffee growing regions. So Bai uses the fruit of a coffee bean, yeah. and that's how we deliver all our antioxidants, and that's how we started. We're born out of the, co- the coffee culture, and this is just paying homage uh, to the coffee culture. So it has the actual longitude and latitude of all these different coffee growing regions on the wall. Hang on. You can switch hands, oh. just so you know. No, no, no. Switch hands. Clearly, yeah. you're not a lefty. Um. <laughs> um, up here, yeah. which is really cool, Joe, this is our civets. Uh, this is a, a big part of our culture here, as you see on the, on the, on the window there. The civet is a, basically a weasel-like creature that runs through coffee plantations and eats coffee fruit. Before us, nobody cared about coffee fruit. It's the discarded part of the coffee harvest. That's, it's like a berry wrapped around the coffee bean? Yeah. Got it. And that product gets thrown away as they um, access the bean for coffee harvesting. We pay homage to the, to the civet because the civet cared about coffee fruit before anyone. We call him the, co- the connoisseur. Got it. He's also the maker of Kapalua coffee, if I don't know, you know what Kapalua coffee uh, is? Uh, it's the world's most expensive coffee. It's processed whole, through his Hawaii? digestive system. Oh, got it. Okay. Right. He poops it out. Copy that. All right. We could have a cup of that, actually. We have it a in a cup of poop. All right. I probably shouldn't talk as I'm eating my celery. <laughs> this is our by kitchen crew right here. Chef Joel is actually... The Spartan who connected he us. Is. Yeah, he's a passionate guy. Um, what we've done is we've put our history on the wall. And, you know, you could walk from idea to today. Oh, there's, the, there's the idea right there. Starts with the idea. This is back in October of 08. I just wanted to put coffee fruit in a drink. And quite frankly, like other beverage entrepreneurs, I actually used sugar at that point in time to make it taste good. Right? So we had three flavors. October of 08, June of 09, we actually put the product in a bottle. And August of 09 is the first case that we ever sold. This is a place called Blauenberg Market. It's right here in, outside of Princeton. Me and my dad just went out and knocked on doors. But to go from idea to selling the first case in less than a year is pretty impressive. And it was just because, uh, I believe, it was the right entrepreneur at the right time. But this was the right like property. the end of the world. This was when the financial uh, meltdown was occurring. The financial meltdown. But the end of my world, my relevant world, is right here, which is where... People decided to stop drinking sugar. Ah. So we call that the diet dilemma. In March of 2010, a couple of months after selling the first case, because I was doing all my sales and distribution, I was also doing all my marketing. And what that means is I'd, I'd get a cooler like this in a store. I'd put up a, a folding table, and I'd just tell people about buy. 
and I'd let them taste it. And what I was noticing is that it was just starting to happen. People would be like, oh, it's a great product, tastes great, love, love the, the, the packaging, how much sugar is in it? And then they'd see the sugar. And at the time, there was 17 calories per serving, uh, 17 grams per serving of sugar, which is basically, you have choices there, right? So at that point in time, you, so I... Had, had you not done that uh, analysis face-to-face with the customer, you might have kept the sugar in. Let's say I was much more nimble than the soda giants, right? right. Whether you saw it, whether they saw what I saw, right. um, I reacted quicker. Got it. And uh, what I did within six months is I created what was then called Buy 5. And Buy 5, never having been a diet drinker, didn't use the word diet on the beverage, didn't use artificial sweetness to make it... Uh, uh, sugarless. Sugarless. Yeah. And tasted fantastic. So we kind of, I always say, we stumbled upon the answer to the diet dilemma, which is the biggest dilemma that's ever plagued the beverage industry. Right. People stop drinking sugar, and they stop trusting artificial sweeteners. And here we are sitting with what I call the holy grail. Right. And that's where the trajectory of the business just went like that. Wow. Yeah. But it's, it's still, at this point, it's just me and my dad yeah. selling locally, um, distributing, and then we went off and got our first distributor out in uh, October of 2010, local guy. So now we're getting some help in distributing. I move out of my basement. I move into buy quarters, like I said, which was just that one room. And then in April of 2013, we thought we were big shots. We sold our first 100,000 cases of buy in a month. That's me and my wife down below. Wow. And on the heels of that, we went and got a national distribution deal with DPSG. And this really was a big deal for us because... In order to disrupt the beverage industry, you have to align with the beverage industry. And we had a partner in, in Dr. Pepper Snapple Group who shared our vision, and we went national with them. 2014. In 2014. But still, very small brand. I mean, we really built the company to about $100 million in sales, 120 to be exact, with only 9% aided brand awareness, which is, I don't think it's ever been done in the beverage industry. Wow. So what we did was we left all of the opportunity in front of the brand, and Really, at that point in time, we just needed to tell people about the brand because we had a big conversion rate, a very high right. conversion rate. Right. And once you tell people about it, they drink they it. They get hooked. And they talk to other people about sure. it and word of mouth. So well, that's what how we, I found out about it, right? Somebody told yeah. me, literally in an email. But Joe, this is where I, I always say, this is where I kind of got everybody a little batty, including people at buy. You know, we were becoming the leading enhanced water in the industry at this point. And I say, well, we, we have something bigger. We have the answer to the diet dilemma. Why does it have to be just an enhanced water? Why can't we do that across every category of beverage? That's never been done before. We could potentially be the new beverage of the, of the, uh, of the future. And to do that, we started with bubbles. So we took our five calories, great taste, no artificial sweeteners platform, and we put it into the sparkling industry. We did anti-water, and we put it into the still water uh, segment. And up here was uh, a defining moment. That's when Dr. Pe- Pepper Snapple decided to acquire us um, Tough in decision. November. No, very easy decision, actually, because as a young brand, you realize you can only grow so big without true support from your, sure. your distributor partner. Over here, you see live feeds into the manufacturing of all of our product. This is actually the variety packing. We have five tenants. You have to is be that an actual civet right there? So that is a civet. Yeah. Um, and these are your five tenets of buy. If you're audacious, you're authentic, you're tenacious, you're obsessive, and you inspire others to be great, yeah. sounds like maybe we have Spartan. something in common. Yeah. You can be great at this company. What's great about the beverage industry, if you have the right product, all it takes is effort. You right. just have to care more than the competition. And for me, this says it all, because that's my dad. And he's a 70-year-old guy with gray hair, two hearing aids, never sold a bottle of anything in his life. And he's loading the truck. This was the first pallet of buy back there. Right. I call that the pallet of potential. If you notice, we're at a storage space. We, didn't have a, we just took a 10 by 10 storage space. Yeah. Three pallets are coming off this truck because it was our first three pallets. I didn't know how to get the product from the front of the truck to the back of the truck. So I'm the guy that tied this to my car and tied it to that pallet to pull it up front. You're lucky the rope didn't wrap around his feet. That I'm lucky. So he and I are sitting there watching, you know, looking at that beautiful pallet, and then we're like, okay, that's great. But how do we get it off the truck onto the floor? So we had to literally hand... Uh, unload it. Unload it, and then it was sitting right on the, on the floor next to the truck, and we said, well, that's great. It took nine months to get that on the floor from idea to actually yeah. being there. And then we said, 
how are we going to get it from there into the <laughs> 10, <laughs> <laughs> 10 by 10 storage bed? Which means we had to unload, unload it again, again yeah. and reload it. And then I said to myself, I know we're in business. So we're a small business because yeah. you do whatever it takes to get from the front of the truck to the back of the truck, from the back of the truck to the floor, from the floor to the shed, and then obviously from the shed to the storage. Yeah. And that's what we did day after day after day, just he and I, until yeah. this thing got traction. It's my daughter who was probably breaking every OSHA law in, in the industry. Uh, when we started with uh, buy, couldn't get the labels onto the bottles. We'd literally pick them up, put the labels on, and throw them through the, uh, the shrink tunnel. Tenacious, you know, we're driving through a, t a snowstorm to sign up our first distributor. That's me and Ari Sorok and our CFO. This is our president being obsessive, and this is how we win at retail. We just out-execute all the competition. Yeah. And there's the civet. The civet, the civet. The civet looks um, tenacious. Well, listen, the civet is the almighty at Pi. I'm going to take you over here, which will take us to the basement, where hopefully I can put this thing down. <laughs> this is our, our Sweetness Institute. This is where we formulate uh, buy, and this is where we do all our QA, QC. We do all our regulatory. You know, for a company our size to make a commitment like this to the next generation of, of sweeteners is unusual. But because we owned that equity, uh, we feel like we always should be at the tip of the spear. So we're always innovating with that. We're always looking at other options. Relentless. How to, yeah, how to right. not use sugar to sweeten a beverage uh, without being artificial. So this is a big commitment to that. As you can see, healthy uh, area. No sugar drinks are permitted in here. If Love you're it. packing sugar, I, I should have patted you down. I don't know if you're packing. <laughs> but from here, uh, we're going to go to the basement. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. Next week, we've got a great interview with Vanessa O'Brien. You guys are going to really want to hear this. This is a woman who completed the grand slam of climbing, like seven top top mountains uh, in the, the world. Is the, that the, what it's seven the, top the, peaks? Se the seven summits and the north and south pole, the okay. Explorer's Grand Slam. But this is a woman who got into mountain climbing late in life. Uh, she was a corporate corporate executive who took some time off and then decided to focus her energies in a different direction and took on a huge challenge. And so, you know, that's something we can all learn. You yeah, know, absolutely. Kind of pivot and do that. And if you want to make sure that you see that and see all of our episodes, whether you listen on iTunes or watch on YouTube, hit subscribe. That means we'll let you know when new episodes are coming out. It also makes sure that other people know about us and uh, you can be part of our mission, rip people off the couch. So, um, yeah, I am now a bi-lever. Oh. All right. There we go. And I, and I'm, unbelieving. I'm an unbeliever by lever, if that makes sense. But here's the thing: we've interviewed. You're, you're the 300th interview we've done. All right. Glad you thought of me so, so soon <laughs> in your career. <laughs> and um, my question is: it's extremely hard to go up against the tide, especially when the tide is I don't know how many billions of dollars the industry, the, you know, the, the the junk drink industry is, if I can call it that, right? No. Oh. Um, how, do you, how do you fight that when everybody around you is saying you're crazy? Well, it's the fight. And it's funny because, um, you know, when I was once talking to somebody along this journey of ours, they, they were interviewing me and they said, would you have as much fun or you, would you be as motivated if the industry wasn't as broken as it is? And, and I thought it was a very perceptive question. And the answer was no, was no I wouldn't enjoy it as much. Uh, I always say I'm In other motivated. Words, if, they were, if there was people already doing it the way you're doing it, and you're just coming. People in. do it the way I'm doing it, you know. But you know, you got to have the right product at the right time with the right unbeliever, yeah. and then the stars need to be aligned. So I mean, so that happens once a decade. Sure. But there's, I always say, there's a graveyard of really great brands out there because we're not in the beverage business. At the end of the day, we're in the distribution business. And unless you know how to navigate through that, you will fall into a huge pothole that will put you behind the eight ball, and you'll never get from behind it. And, and the industry isn't set up to make guys like me successful, right? Not, I don't say that in a, in, a, in a bad way. I mean, it's just, you know, these are big companies that uh, have big infrastructures, and it's hard to, to be relevant within those infrastructures. So a lot of times you'll see, you know, those brands ultimately get euthanized. Uh, and I'm not saying by design. It's just, you know, you got to know what to do with a high-growth brand in, a, in an industry that's not known for high growth, right? So... Um, we were able to, we were fortunate to align with Dr. Pepper Snapple Group uh, because they have an open network, um, and they've been a great partner. So ultimately, when they acquired us, they knew what they were getting. Um, 
And it's just a tenacious sales effort and a bunch of people who love their brand. And the brand happens to be what consumers are thirsty for, pun intended. You know, they, they are looking for a low calorie drink that doesn't use artificial sweeteners. Um, so we, like I said earlier, we were sitting there with the answer to the diet dilemma and we knew that and empowered us. Uh, but we're also just a very tenacious group and we go out there and we care more and we out execute and we built proof of concept and we scaled it. Um, and we've taken this brand to heights most brands have not seen. Uh, and yet there's so much opportunity in front of it still. How do you apply everything we talked about? How do you apply that? Cause the, the, the listeners out there and the, and the, and the people watching this are saying, well, how could I apply some of these lessons to my own life? How could I get more motivated? Mm -hmm. How could I be successful as a mom, a monk, whatever it is they're trying to do? What would you say to them? Well, you know, listen, from a business perspective, and I've had many of them, um, I would say I, I, never create, I never got a paycheck from a company. I create things. And if they're successful, people buy it, I make some money. If they don't buy it, I don't make money. And there were plenty of times they didn't buy it. Um, but from a business perspective, it's all about the product. You know, you know, I ran as hard against previous businesses as I do against buy. I thought that they would be as big as buy. Um, so you need to have the product that's on trend and what people are thirsty for. In this case, we, we were fortunate enough we got, got that pretty much out of the gate. Uh, but when you are confident and you know that, uh, you run hard. You just, and quite frankly, when you don't know it, I always say this, kind of like, I always feel like there's this invisible hand pushing me. And sometimes you don't feel it. And you're like, wait a second, maybe this isn't the product. You know, it kind of hurts to bang my head against that wall 10 times. Sure. At some point, I'm going to stop banging my head against the wall. So you've got to have the product. And if you don't have the product, you've got to be honest with yourself and say, you know, either I need to fix this product or I need to but figure out But what if it's path. not in business? What if it's a relationship or a job or, or, or whatever? Uh, I don't know if you want to take relationship <laughs> advice from me. Although, <laughs> I have been married for a long time and I have a great family. And, uh, you know... What makes my relationship great, uh, um, amongst other things, is that she believes in me, or unbelieves alongside me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're aligned in, in life, you know? Uh, same thing in my relationship. You know, in previous businesses, the person right next to me was my wife, and she thought the same of those ideas that I did. Just, you know, again, I, I don't mean to take it always back to business. Um, you know, from a relationship perspective, you know, I surround myself with like-minded people, whether I'm married to one or uh, I employ one or I'm friends with one. We're all, in a sense, unbelievers and dreamers and willing to kind of envision something and work hard at evaluating whether it could be a reality. Sometimes they're not a reality, you know? You f I've failed as much as I've succeeded in, in business, and I'm proud of my failures. Matter of fact, it teaches you, right? It teaches you, and I think when I walk through by, I think, you know, early on at least, I used to lean more on the failures than I did on the successes. Sure. Yeah. So, so big takeaways, work hard, vision. A, sorry, I couldn't be more insightful than that. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of hard work. You know, right. I look at brands now, and I, I was just saying this, I, sometimes I just get exhausted just looking at them, not yeah. because they're bad brands. Uh, not because I don't believe that the person behind the brand can do it. It's just a path. You gotta be willing to take the path. You, for me, there's no shortcut. You know, it, you just can't. We did it in seven years. We got to a, a where we are today, and in seven years, which is lightning quick. But it wasn't by design. It just happened that way. Uh, but I'm already onto what's the next, you know, goal. And um, you know, at the end of the day, you can't fail by working hard. Right. You know, right. because your failures are still if you if they're rooted in hard work, somehow you, you lean on them way, and they, the yeah, yeah, you'll find success. You might find a result. door on the wall. Yeah, maybe that's wall. our common. <laughs> maybe we'll, right? <laughs> Finally, the door opens. <laughs> <laughs> Couple of guys from the boroughs, I guess, huh? trying to find their way out. This is awesome. I am now locked in the basement. I guess this is the last <laughs> podcast you'll ever see me in. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Thanks. A little confusing, right? Because when I got there, I walk in, we did a road trip, uh, Marion and I, and it was like, boom, I was on cue and I really didn't understand. I just thought, you know, normally I sit around and we just shoot the shit and you, you had an opinion on that. Well, I, it, it was a little bit different because you were receiving a briefing, right? Yeah. That looked to me, I don't know his background, but that looked like almost military precision, a briefing. 
The hallway is set up like I see a lot of military hallways are in the Pentagon, what we call the command hallway. So he had his lineage and his honors, the history of his organization on the wall, and so he can use that as a visual, gigantic PowerPoint slides, essentially, on the wall, right? You walk, you stop at your mark, you hit your mark, you give the briefing of what's there. I mean, it's very, very effective, yeah. and it's done, like I say, and he even used the term tip of the spear, which is clearly a military term. Uh, you would think that for most corporations, it would be cutting edge, forward edge, leaning edge, uh, industry disruptor, leader, whatever. I don't hear a lot of industries using tip of the spear as their, their sure. buzzword. I, I, fa explained. I failed. I didn't ask if he had a military background, but I think you might be nailing it. we got to get well, in touch with that. I, I don't know. But he, we need one of those hallways at the Spartan office. <laughs> he sure owned his story, though. Like, incredible how things that most people would have to put an effort into saying just rolled off his tongue. Like, whether he was talking <laughs> about his dad taking the first case off the truck or he was talking about... The uh, the the animal that the civet that is the yeah. that is the, uh, the their, their their spirit animal because yeah. it was the first one that saw the value in the fruit around the coffee. Um, he just like you can tell that he sleeps, eats, breathes, mm. just owns this. And when you talk about uh, uh, success leaves clues, you know I, I know that that's our, our friend Zach's favorite expression. Man, this guy he just he found the clues and he's leaving clues for everyone else in terms of if you can get that passionate and that committed and own your story that well, you know, Joe, you as, as you say, everyone's always selling, yeah. but but he um, uh, he he you cannot be around him without believing in him, I, or, I, or as he says, unbelieving. I walked oh. out of, of there and I thought to myself, I can't believe the amount of time and expense that he put into. To your point, to the, 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 the presentation. presentation and the military walkway. Right. And then I also, the, um, the rewarding of the super workers, if you will, you know, yeah. pointing out, okay, you, you three did great this, I don't know what it is, month, quarter, year, whatever. Sure. But by naming those people and giving them something, something to aspire no, to. Another military clue for you? Or? Well, I mean, it, you know, is it any different than giving somebody a ribbon, you right. know, a medal right. or something? Yeah. And, and, but in the military, when you, when you get a medal or a ribbon, right, you're wearing it. So people see it. So he's made a room where people can see these guys did better than I did. Boom, it's right there. So it's, again, I think there is some linkage there. I've, uh, we've interviewed lots of business owners, lots of startups, and none of them, none of them have taken that painstaking effort to um, put the story, the narrative together in a way to he present it story. like that. And at the end, I don't know if you noticed, we went into like this secret room that was literally like young Frankenstein. It was a bookshelf we had to push. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, he, yeah. but not only did it forget about the presentation, like it probably cost them 400 grand to build the room. Yeah, right, sure. Right, but there was a purpose in it. But yeah, when, when 1.7 billion, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it worked. But, but yeah. when you talk about that, when you say, you know, it's hard to believe that, you know, they've only sold $100 million and yet they sold for 1.7 billion. And there are a lot of companies that have sold that much that didn't sell for that much. But I think that's why, because, you know, whoever he was pitching to could see the momentum, could see the future. And, the and, brand and, and, value. And what he invested in that story and that, and that whole package. Um, just think about if you went into every presentation, you know, whether you're selling yourself or your company or your business or your product, and you had as much passion and created such a compelling story. I think we'd all be able to sell ourselves or whatever we're selling for significantly more than it would be worth on paper if we could get people as invested as he is. Yeah. yeah. I'm, we got to work with you, Colonel Nye, and create some military presentations around here. And some secret down. rooms. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I think it's a secret. I have some ideas. <laughs> well, and I like, I mean, he's obviously just a marketing genius, right? I mean, right. when like, it's like goes back to another podcast that we'll have with Jeff Gomez, I believe he does transmedia. Right. And transmedia is like, how do you create this holistic world around you and your brand? How do you make it your everything, your every fiber? And um, I love the way he says, dare to unbelieve. He pronounced un pronounced unbelieve or yes, I can. A transitive verb, unbelieve, unbelieving. The deep desire to, to defy the status quo, to question con conventional wisdom, to be an unstoppable force of unique flavor. When you unbelieve, you don't listen to people who say that great taste and good for you must be two different drinks. Well, yeah, so and, it's like, and, and when he talks about that, he talked about solving the diet dilemma, and he said that several times. Yeah. And again, uh, buzzword, except that, you know, he talked about the fact that people... It's not that they didn't like the taste of sugar. It's not that they didn't like. They just didn't want it. it was bad for them. And, and he said so that uh, that just he, they released their first their first flat, their first bunch of cases that had sugar in it, and then realized, uh oh, overnight people don't want sugar. And he said they were just much more nimble. They were able to get it out so fast and spin their story so fast. 
And um, so what do you call it? Uh, um, five, take five or high five or not yeah. high five. But, um, but the idea about immediately, they didn't talk about diet. They didn't talk about what you didn't have. They talked about incredible flavor, five calories, all natural, good for you, and got ahead of that curve. You know, as the wave was starting to break and other people would have been drowned by it, they immediately jumped up and surfed that to success. Yes, yeah, surf the wave, Johnny. There you go. It's hard, it's hard to pivot. With that said, okay. we want you to pivot. Check out Spartan dot com slash podcast you could learn all about buy figure out how to sell yourself and your company for 1.7 billion dollars or just become a monk or a mom or a mechanic cat. whatever it, whatever it is but be great at it yeah right? absolutely and be positive thank you for watching another epic story of success if you like our message please share smarten up with your friends and subscribe on itunes youtube or wherever you catch our show maybe in the woods Spartan Up is brought to you by Spartan Race. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com.